Before moving to a superbike in 2009, Brock Parks was a regular visitor to the podium in the World Supersport Series. The 29-year-old admits he never got the chance to properly showcase his talent on the superbike, with injury and poor team management hindering his career. I broke my leg two weeks before Phillip Island training on a motocross bike, so you know that made my year really difficult. And um, you know we we had an underfunded team in superbike. At the end of last season, Parks got the chance to fill in for an injured Kawasaki rider in the Supersport class, and he grabbed the opportunity with both hands. A third and a fourth in two of the last three races of the season had everyone in his corner pushing for a full-time return to the series. Kawasaki quickly made him a permanent part of the team. He relocated his young family to the small nation of Andorra between France and Spain to begin testing his new bike, and he's clearly impressed his new employer. Well, I think they've sort of moved me back there to win the World Championship, and you know that's what I want to do. I've, you know, I've been runner-up two times in the world, and I think you know next step is to win the World Championship. Parks heads to Phillip Island tomorrow to prepare for next weekend's first race of the season. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. This was all that was left of the Toyota Corolla after the horrific accident. It appears to have collided with the median strip as it's arrived at the intersection with Cowper Street. It's continued through the intersection um, onto the roundabout and collided with a tree. The 36-year-old male driver was killed instantly. Police say it's remarkable no one else was injured. There is a lot of cyclists that use this road for rides on a Saturday morning, but on a weekday, yes, the potential, it could have been much worse. Traffic diversions were put in place while police launched an investigation having identified several factors that may have contributed to the crash. The three obvious ones at the moment are speed, alcohol and fatigue because it happened at quarter past six in the morning. Um, we're looking at those as being the most likely. Officers are again urging drivers to think before getting behind the wheel. People need to be careful driving motor vehicles on the road, the road safety is very important and uh, we just encourage people to drive to the conditions and drive responsibly. Emma Murphy, NBN News.
I'm so excited. It's the 150th year, so it is an absolute honour to be representing Maitland. His mum and his sister both gave up their full-time jobs um, to, to look after him and uh, full-time. So they've effectively acted as his carers. Needing a win to have any chance of scraping into the finals, Sydney got out of the blocks quickly thanks to Katie Ebsery. By quarter time, the 22-year-old was the key to keeping the flames firing. With plenty at stake, no one was giving ground and the hits kept on coming. By half time, the underdog flames had managed to sneak to a one-point lead. Ebsery then re-emerged, still keen to put her body on the line as Sydney pushed for an upset. At three-quarter time, the home side had established a ten-point advantage. But in the final term, the Capitals showed why they're challenging for the title. Despite Ebsery's best efforts, Canberra got home by three. The Capitals will face Bulleen next weekend in the opening semi and are expected to be boosted by the return of the Hunters' Susie Batkovich. Green's candidate for the seat of Wall's End, Keith Parsons, says it's high time Glendale received its regional interchange. It's been mooted since 1998. Bob Carr in 98 said they'd be funding one. I think he set a target of 2002. Well, it's 2011, and all we've got so far is a bit of pork barrelling a week ago, talking about half a million dollars towards planning. The comment starting a political bun fight. Current member for Wall's End, Sonia Hornery, couldn't be contacted today, but Minister for the Hunter, Jody McKay, had this to say. If Keith Parsons had done his homework, he would understand that this is what Lake Macquarie Council has asked for, which is for us to work with them so that we can get that land opened. She says a key to the planned success is investment in Glendale. By uh, providing this crucial bit of funding and support as well by Railcorp to engage with Lake Macquarie Council on this, you provide all the more reason for that submission to have uh, value for both levels of government. We can hardly expect the federal government to put up serious money towards it unless the state government, whoever's in power, commits to a lot more than half a million towards proper funding. And Mr Parsons says for that to happen, all candidates must make the issue an election priority. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News.
The Panthers were missing seven of their regular first-grade stars, but winger Sandor Earl proved there was still quality in the ranks. Newcastle had also rested four of its best, and hooker Kevin Kingston took advantage of that. Forward Mark Tafua responded for the Knights, easing through the defence from close range. Shortly before half-time, Newcastle was less than impressed when Travis Burns upended Shannon McDonnell. Burns ended up on report, while McDonnell was left with a slight concussion and will be on light duties at training this week. After the break, the Knights found their feet, two tries giving them the lead for the first time. But Harry Seeker had the last laugh. With scores locked at 22 all, the halfback set up Adrian Pertell for the match-winning try. The two sides will square off again in round one of the Premiership. Before then, the Knights will travel to Musselbrook next weekend to take on the Sharks. Kurt Gidley out of McDougal and, and definitely Aku Uato to play in that game. And um, yeah, it's looking something a little bit closer to what we're going to look like in round one against Penrith. The Newcastle board was supposed to meet with representatives from the Tinkler Group this afternoon to finalise preparations to privatise the club. Instead, this morning, Nathan Tinkler sent an email to board members informing them he was withdrawing his offer to buy the club. In the email, which was obtained by NBN News, the mining magnate expresses his frustration with the board's handling of the negotiations. This afternoon, the Knights stated their case. To the rugby league world, Nathan Tinkler's offer seemed impossible to refuse. The Knights board believes it was simply too good to be true. The reality is that a number of key elements of the proposal, initially tabled on the 17th of January, have been withdrawn over the past few weeks to the point where the offer we were left with is a pale imitation of the original offer. With the Tinkler deal off the table, the board is now championing a patron's trust model, which they say was first introduced last year. At least three patrons have committed to providing a minimum of $2 million each per year over the next four years. We have minimum initial commitments of between 6 and $10 million over four years. This amount would be paid in cash with the club continuing to be owned by members as a community asset. When Nathan informed Rob this morning that he was going to withdraw, we asked those patrons to attend a meeting and got confirmation that they were still happy to proceed. The deal will be taken to the members next Monday. No representatives from the Tinkler Sports Group were willing to speak on camera, but they released a statement, saying regretfully there are too many differences between the two parties that remain unresolved. They added this ends our interest in this matter with the current Knights Board. We will not be engaging in further discussion. In contrast, the email sent by Nathan Tinkler to board members was scathing and direct. The mining magnate says Newcastle will never again receive this type of offer. He goes on to place the blame for his decision on the shoulders of club directors, in particular their handling of the negotiations and their recent questioning of the deal. Tinkler then takes a parting shot at Rob Chew and Steve Burriston, saying he hopes they can apply as much energy to moving the club forward as they have to holding back this process. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
Senior Constable Stephen Michael Watkins, who's currently suspended from the force, was supported by family for the first day of a district court trial. The 41-year-old has pleaded not guilty to three counts of indecent assault, plus a single count of committing an act of indecency. The seven-man, five-woman jury was this morning impanelled and the Crown Prosecutor opened the case. It's alleged the 16-year-old complainant walked into Charlestown Police Station on November 8, 2009 to report her wallet had been stolen. She also needed help to return to Taro or a refuge in Maitland as she had no money. It's alleged Stephen Watkins volunteered to drive the teenager home in a police car when, while still driving, he grabbed her hand and put it on his groin area. It's also alleged he later pulled over and rubbed her crotch and then sucked her chest and finally touched himself for a period of time. The jury was told the 16-year-old recalls telling Mr Watkins, take me home, you're a freak, and take me home, you pedophile. The Crown Prosecutor told the jurors the complainant has been consistent all the way through the investigation and some evidence backs up her account. The jurors were told the officer's clothes and the police car were examined, as well as the teenager's clothes, and no semen was detected. But there was the accused's saliva on the swab taken from the complainant's breast. The seven-day trial continues. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. A $20 million eight-storey beachside resort. It's proposed on a patch of land at Blacksmiths, the location across the road from the former airport. And for some, that's the problem. The development should not go ahead if it impedes a future development of the airport, which is what we all want here. The planes will literally fly over the resort before landing here. And according to those who don't want it to happen, that's the big risk. This place could one day be a training ground for pilots. Well, um, the Central Coast Aero Club is still quite confident that they will be making a move. But a report to go before council tonight recommends the resort be approved. It says the Civil Aviation Safety Authority raised no objection. The development could be built clear of flight paths for small aeroplanes at least. The plans have been scaled back from when they were first submitted nine years ago and the Deputy Mayor says it's time now for takeoff. It's going to create employment. And I think the issues that needed to be addressed have been addressed. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Like many landfills, a Awaba is filling fast. At the current rate of use, it'll reach capacity in five years. Much of the waste is organic household material that Lake Macquarie Council says could be put to better use. That's 60% you know, of material that doesn't need to go into landfill and we can divert uh, for beneficial uses. Council officers have proposed introducing an extra bin for fortnightly collection of food scraps and garden waste. It's part of a $1.8 billion waste management strategy to be implemented over 30 years. Mr Farrell says the plan has received broad support during community consultation, although he concedes there may need to be allowances for people living in units. Possibly um, they can um, use smaller bins or could use uh, uh, share bins of various sizes or we can adjust the frequency of the collection. Uh, a range of those things will need to be looked at to uh, deal with services to multi-unit dwellings. A council committee will discuss the recommendations tonight with a decision expected to be made by the full council next week. If given the go-ahead, the extra bin could be introduced early next year. Well, I think for business travellers, that uh, as I am, it'd be good to, to, to get email etc. when you're on the train, particularly on long journeys. And for other people, they can they can access the internet and, and keep in touch.
Nathan Tinkler was so confident he would own the Knights, it's been widely reported the mining magnate has been actively chasing players on behalf of the NRL club. Cade Snowden, Jamal Idris and Michael Ennis were all apparently on the radar as Tinkler attempted to bring former juniors from the Hunter and North Coast to Newcastle. You know, if that's the case, it just shows a, a complete arrogance and, and, uh, and, and unprofessionalism. And, and I guess that put doubts in our mind as well. The Tinkler Group offer guaranteed all profits would be pumped back into the club for development, but that wasn't enough for the board. We understand the financial commitment to development is substantial. However, we require an ironclad commitment guaranteeing a minimum expenditure on development in the region. The directors say the Tinkler deal would have also taken control of the club completely out of the hands of members. A patron's trust model would see wealthy contributors pumping millions into the Knights, who allegedly want nothing in return. At the Knights, the patron's trust would be used to access funds for capital expenditure, junior development, community programs, special projects, resource improvements and the like. The board is hoping members will vote on that proposal next Monday. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Great, great feeling, you know, emotional because, you know, winning here for a sixth time, not too often you can claim that you, uh, you know, that you beat Jeremy's record and have one more than him. Um, it, it's a lot of pressure in the fact that um, you're, 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 you're out laying a lot of money. The Knights board is now promoting the Patrons Trust model as the way forward and Andrew Poole agrees. The Patrons Trust has simply got two objectives. One is to keep the Knights a community owned club and two is to enhance and ensure the financial viability of the Knights. That viability would come from a $1.5 million cash injection from three patrons each year for four years with an option to extend. No strings attached, there's nothing in it for the patrons, there'll be no return for the patrons. The other two are yet to be named, but this self-confessed Dragon supporter is already hoping to attract more patrons to increase that figure to $2.5 million. Newcastle's been good to me, I've been successful in business, I owe it to Newcastle. I'm more than happy to put some of that back in to the Newcastle community. Mr Poole will attend a members meeting on Monday to state his case. Last night, several members staged a last-minute gathering with one goal in mind, to get enough signatures to force the board and the Tinkler Group to face them together. So that we can all move forward with an informed opinion, rather than the toing and froing that we've seen in the media. 57 put pen to paper, including former Knights Steve Crow and Tony Butterfield. The ex-club captain says he's lost faith in some of the board. I too would like to find out uh, the detail of the arrangements and, and exercise my rights as a member. Organiser Mark York is planning another signing session for the Gunya Hotel on Wednesday and possibly in Maitland or Cessnock on Friday. Everything coming out of the Knights has been, yeah, it's for the members, it's for the members, but at no stage have the members had this proposal put to them. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. A scene all too familiar on the New England highway, but one Barry O'Farrell and his Liberal team say they can fix. $45 million to improve this stretch of the New England highway here in Maitland. Too many deaths over too many years. We've got $45 million on the table to start work straight away. 
It's got the support of the Maitland Mayor. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. As well as Greg Mutton, whose stepson almost died on the stretch of road. It's good to see that uh, at least the politicians are starting to put some money there instead of constantly saying, no, we're not going to give Maitland anything. But according to the seat's Labor incumbent, Frank Terenzini, the announcement is simply a way of buying votes. He claims the package not only lacks detail, but rides on the coattails of Labor plans already underway. Both Mr O'Farrell and Ms Parker wouldn't specify on exactly how the money would be spent, instead listing a number of options already put forward by the Labor government. The government's own plans tell us there are a range of options here. We want the experts to decide. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. We will not be removing marine parks, but we will put in place a moratorium on the creation of new marine parks. These so-called sanctuary zones are not sanctuaries at all. They don't protect anything against the real threats to our marine environment and associated ecosystems. So to call them marine protected areas is part of the GFC. And the GFC has always been, as far as the Labor Party and the Greens are concerned, the great fishing con. Ten years ago, John Dawson would struggle to walk up a flight of stairs. But today, thanks to a double lung transplant, he's back on his feet and full of life. I wake up every day and I thank that person very much. Before his transplant, lung disease had left the Waratah father of three in pain with only weeks to live. Life was um, just a battle, full on battle. Um, days where you wake up and think you wish you were dead. Doctors like George Breaver from the John Hunter Hospital specialise in organ and tissue transplants and say getting people talking about organ donation seems to be working. That has been increasing over the last few years. Um, in between 13 and 16 every year we have been experiencing some increases and the increases are probably and most likely because family did have a chance to discuss this. The state government has compiled a book of stories about people whose lives have been touched by organ transplants. The book is touring public libraries throughout the state and you can find details about the book tour and how to become a donor at www.donatelife.gov.au. Battered, bruised and swollen, Marie Martin was walking her guide dog along Freeman's Drive at Morisset at 10.30 yesterday morning when she was attacked by two men. I was hit on the head from behind and pushed to the ground and um, as I went to get up I was hit again in the face with something solid. The 59-year-old is legally blind. I knew one was at the, behind me checking my back and the other was to the side and just hit me on the face as I went to get up. The cowardly attack took place near Stockton Creek Bridge and lasted less than a minute. I can only guess it was someone looking for easy money or, or something like that. Detectives yesterday door knocked nearby residents hoping that one of them may have witnessed the crime but so far they haven't had any luck. Today they issued a public appeal asking that witnesses come forward. For anyone that may have seen a vehicle, the assault or the offenders to come forward and pass any information on to us. Madeline McKell, NBN News.
it's clear why they're among the rising stars of Australian basketball. And shots like these haven't been hard to find at this year's National Under-20s Championships at Maitland. With has been great, there's been some fantastic games, so um, you know, we're pleased with how it's all going. Among the 400 players from across Australia and New Zealand... Hannah Young, yep, playing for New South Wales, um, plays out of Newcastle, which is fantastic for her. And sharing the courts with the under-20s, players competing in the Ivor Burge Championships. The event's in its 16th year and showcases the talents of people with a range of disabilities. They're very exciting players, they love it, they're uh, very good at what they do, great communicators and great to watch. And for everyone competing in the championships, a reminder to be on your game. And the scouters are out there, like NBL guys are up here, there's American guys out here looking, so yeah, everyone's watching. And the stadium will be well equipped for post-championship celebrations on Saturday, following a renovation by tradesmen led by former Knight Paul Harrigan. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. All I can do is concentrate on coaching and um, the rumours are flying pretty thick and fast at the moment so my job is to focus, control the things I can control. Um, it's been a while since Matty's been back in the red and blue colours and uh, he's certainly got a, a real good footy brain on him. Their scenes reminiscent of Newcastle's own earthquake back in 1989, so it's fitting Novocastrians are among a 73-strong state emergency task force being sent to help our trans-Tasman neighbours. Four of which come from the Newcastle local area. Two station officers and two firefighters have been deployed. That's along with two paramedics, Scott Hards and Bruce Shyak wise They'll be involved in search and rescue missions using the same equipment that belongs to a specialised unit in Newcastle. Now this here is known as the Urban Search and Rescue Vehicle. It's one of only three in the state and contains all the equipment necessary to deal with a major disaster, just like in New Zealand. We've got hydraulic gear for lifting slabs, trains, you name it. We've got 50 tonne hydraulics. Um, we can lift just about anything, uh, then you go into the cutting to get access to a any area in a building. And while rescue crews will have plenty to deal with in New Zealand, they're not the only ones who may be affected by the devastation. But in Newcastle particularly, uh, it was us. And for those who are very deeply involved in the earthquake here 20 odd years ago, the, the scenes are similar. And Christchurch being so much like Newcastle that it's almost as though the footage was shot in Newcastle. And so they actually align with it. A special vigil will be held at Newcastle's Christchurch Cathedral on Friday at 7.30. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News.
It's about also recognising that we need to make sure tourists and visitors to the area know that we have a bus that can link them into our great restaurant districts, to our attractions and our experiences. We're afraid that it may ultimately end up as a pub, uh, a venue for selling alcohol without food. It won't be open to the public as in a bar, it'll be open to the public to use as a function centre. She's performed on stages across the globe next to legends of the music industry. But when country star Catherine Britt was asked to host a masterclass, you could say she got a little stage fright. I actually was really nervous, to be honest. I don't know how much of a master I am of these things. I've just kind of jumped into the music industry and done what I do. But it was how the 26-year-old made it big in the music industry that these youngsters wanted to hear. 15 lucky students from seven schools across Newcastle and the Central Coast spent the afternoon with the Golden Guitar winner learning first-hand some singing and songwriting tips. And for anyone keen on pursuing a music career, here's some very simple but sound advice. Work hard, you know. There's never a moment in my life where I slacked off um, and still to this day I work my behind off. You know, I'm always running, I'm always trying to improve, I'm always trying to get better. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. The driver did notice some sort of power loss and when he looked in his rear vision mirror noticed smoke coming from behind him. The bus went up within three, three to four minutes. A father and son back together after 15 years. It's going to be different, definitely, but I'm um, absolutely delighted to be here. Jason Kalina has agreed to a three-year deal to play under Dad Branker. Whilst selfishly I would have preferred not to be in this situation, um, you know, I couldn't go against the club's wishes, which is to bring quality players. We've got a policy within the club now to play attacking, attractive football next year and Jason is just going to complement that uh, policy enormously. Aside from 59 Socceroos caps, Kalina has starred for the Gold Coast this A-League season. He still had a year to run on his contract. It's not disappointing because I think we got the best and the maximum out of Jason. Perhaps the side will be more critical if it loses another star. As Shane Smeltz is obviously someone, as Jason said, every club would like to have. Nat Wallace, NBN News. The Knights called in the Blue and Red Army. It was a very informative meeting, thank you. 30 key members were briefed by the club on the collapse of the Tinkler offer. No interest in the Tinkler deal now? No comment. No comment, no, no comment on that one. No comment. In fact, they were told by officials not to talk.
Do you still have faith in the current Knights board? The CEO didn't stop to discuss the meeting either. Instead, it was back to the bunker to prepare for what's fast becoming a war. It appears the pressure is really mounting. A board meeting set down for tonight now looks as though it won't go ahead with at least one director calling for the chairman's head. Then there's those signatures. If 30 more members join the list, the board will have to put the Tinkler deal back on the table. And what I've been about all the time, all along is, is, is for that to happen from both sides, direct to the members. Some of the club's former big names agree. And for a moment, it appeared the Knights did too. But the club says its official Twitter account was hacked. Yet the problems are mounting. Remember this mess. According to the state government, the Knights still owe $435,000 over damage to the stadium surface. The 30-day waiting period expires in a few days. Nat Wallace, NBN News. After beating 500 bands in Australia and New Zealand, the Tilligra Damned can boast being the global battle of the band's Australasian champions. The next step, jetting off to Malaysia to fight for the world title. Just going to go over there and enjoy the experience and live life and have fun. With $100,000 up for grabs and bands from more than 32 countries competing, the pressure is on for the group formed just a few months ago. There's been a lot of hard work. This competition is actually where it all started. The first heat in Newcastle, uh, that's where we actually all play together um, in our current lineup for the first time. The band has enjoyed local success, playing alongside Australian rock acts Jericho and After the Fall. And members credit a wide range of influences for their rising popularity. We try to capture like better aspects from each style and put it together and come up with something that's you know, unique and original and people are going to remember us for. They plan to release their debut single, Silver Bullet, and start working on an album after they return from Malaysia. They'll take to the stage there this Saturday. It looked for all the world that Nathan Tinkler had walked away. But today, Knight's bosses confirmed they're now reviewing a new takeover offer from the mining magnate, which from early indication seems to address the club's main concerns. The latest development is largely thanks to this man, NIB CEO Mark Fitzgibbon, who intervened in the 11th hour to get the deal back on track. Mr Fitzgibbon says he's pleased to be involved and hopes the new offer suits both parties. Knights management won't specify what's changed, nor will the club's coaching staff. It's not ideal, but um, you know we've got a job to do and the people that are negotiating the deal have got a job to do, so that, that's their particular role and ours is to concentrate on footy. And Him taking over is going to be a huge uh, thing for the club, but until that happens, you know it's only speculation for the players. 
Meanwhile, a 150 signature petition was handed to Knights HQ today. The petition is to call an extraordinary general meeting um, at which the Tinkler Sports Group will have an opportunity to speak to the members along with the board. And whether that meeting happens remains to be seen. Steve Burriston today indicated Nathan Tinkler's latest offer could be put to a member's vote around the 30th of March. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. The sickening attack is alleged to have happened here at Market Town Shopping Centre at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. According to police, Robert Turnbull followed the seven-year-old girl into a toilet cubicle and sexually assaulted her. The 38-year-old was arrested at his Hamilton South home a short time later. He was charged with aggravated sexual assault, aggravated indecent assault, attempted sexual intercourse and assault with intent to have sexual intercourse. During today's bail application, Newcastle Local Court heard police allegations that a palm print found on top of the cubicle door matched that of Turnbull. It also heard the accused was on a good behaviour bond in relation to a stalking and intimidation matter. Magistrate Buscombe refused bail, saying the prosecution had a strong case. Turnbull's due to face court again next Wednesday. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. It's like very uh, therapeutic. Everyone should do it. All our friends in the Hunter are coming down and they're going to show us what they love and, uh, and the character of what they do. One final hit out before Saturday's match with coach Rick Stone still fine-tuning the squad. He's replaced Peter Matatui with fullback Shannon McDonnell while an injury cloud still hangs over Ben Rogers. He came up with a little knee issue after the weekend's game and he's seen a specialist in Sydney today, which he may need a quarter zone in that knee after the game, but at this stage he'll be playing. Adam McDougall is a certain starter in what will be his first match of the pre-season. He's always pretty careful about the trial games he plays, but if he can get 60 minutes out for, for me and um, yeah, get some positional sense around what he's got to do and, and, and touch the ball and make some tackles, yeah, we'll be happy with that. You know, they're always uh, mentally challenging to get up for trials, but um, obviously we're expecting a big crowd up there, so it should be uh, pretty easy to get ourselves up for this one. So too, Aku Yuate. Mate, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think the boys are all pumped. Oh, I'm pretty pumped myself for the first game back for the Knights.
Well, I think Kaku's going to definitely um, you know, hit the ground running from where he did last year. He's an exciting player. The Knights tackled the Sharks at Olympic Park at 7.30. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. These teeny tiny reptiles are sure to be a big, big hit. They're around seven weeks old and small enough to be scooped up in a fishnet. Animal carer Shane Holmes says they've already developed distinct personalities. The other guy that's in the tank, he's a real quiet one. He likes to hide a lot. This guy's the real feisty one. He's very nasty. He'll bite you if you let him. Although even the troublemaker remained a little shy on camera today. Come on. Talk. The freshwater hatchlings form part of Hunter Wetland Centre's revamped animal exhibition and when they're a bit bigger, will even be taken out and about. Hopefully we'll train them up nice not to bite people's fingers off so I can do my shows with and show the community. The crocs were transported down from a farm in Darwin and will stay at the centre for the next four or five years or until they grow to 1.2 metres long. All these little guys need now is some names of their own and the community will be asked to have their say during a naming competition that will be held in the next few weeks. In the meantime, I vote that they get named Paul and Tash. Madeline McKell, NBN News. Another day, another series of state election promises. A $20 million investment uh, to upgrade this road, to make it safer. The money, the coalition says, will be spent on the road between Raymond Terrace and Dungog over seven years to smooth, widen and remove black spots. The Nationals leader also used the announcement to take a swipe at Labor. The current state government originally promised this, then withdrew it when they withdrew the Tilligra Dam. Politics aside, Dungog's mayor believes a new road would substantially boost local tourism. That road is being identified amongst Dungog community as the great impediment to the progress of our town. And the multi-million dollar pledges didn't stop there, with claims wine country would also benefit from a coalition government. Another $20 million to improve the broke road so the experience for the tourists and the locals alike uh, will be much better. That upgrade is scheduled to take place over four years. This represents a connection now between the Golden Highway from the west and uh, the New England and ultimately the extension of the F3 freeway. But Roads Minister David Borger argues the opposition has not promised what kind of road upgrade will be delivered and that it will be funded by increasing Hunter Water bills. Madeline McKell, NBN News.